Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. I'm super excited to chat to Liesl. I'm a huge fan of hers, and we've had the pleasure of speaking a few times before. Um, Liesl, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, it's my pleasure. So I saw Kid Victory yesterday, and I loved it. I highly encourage everyone to go. I wanted to kick off by just chatting about the show and what it's about. So before going into it, I'll, all I knew was that it's the story of a boy who goes missing and his return. And I came out thinking, this is so much more. It's a coming of age story. Without giving too much away, it's the story about the complexity of relationships. Can we talk a little bit about the story? Sure. Um, so the way I think about it is that it's a story about a boy who growing up in the Midwest to a very religious, conservative um, family and community. And then he is kidnapped and taken away for a year. And the story itself is about his re-entry. So when a life-changing event happens and you come back to your world, which hasn't changed, how do you integrate yourself, um, your new self, into your old place? Um, and as, as a family who's dealing with a, a child who's come back um, from a crisis, how do they help or not help? Um, and it's really just about how we in the modern world communicate or don't communicate. When we're ready to deal with truth telling and when we're not. Um, and that's what, what excited me about the show is it's so complex and it's so universal and it's so human. And every single one of us has gone through a point um, with our families where communication has broken down or where breakthroughs has, have happened. Um, and it seems such a simple premise, but it's one of the hardest things um, that we go through. I think that's why so many people, um, at least in New York anyway, are in therapy. <laughs> Definitely. I feel like anyone can relate to that communication breakdown yeah. uh, as a child as, or as a parent. Yeah. That was something really beautiful in the show, which I wasn't expecting mm -hmm. at all. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing that that's, I was also very moved by in the script was, you know, the, the idea that parents, in a way, are winging it too. Like, they don't know what the right thing to do um, is, and so many mistakes are made, and then so many moments of grace are found um, in, in the process of parenting, and the same in the process of being a child. There's times when you know more than your parents do, and no one ever teaches you how to be in that moment, how to be a, a child who knows more than the parent. Um, and all of these incredible nuances the writers have, have mined in, in an, a really fresh and beautiful way. There is more that I want to ask you about, but we can't because I don't want to give away too much about the show. You're going to have to go and see it to discover. There's definitely a lot to discover. Uh, one thing I did want to ask you about on stage here that you and I have spoken about before is... You got this crazy phone call out of the blue to work on this project. So for anyone who doesn't know, the musical is written by Greg Pierce and John Kander. John Kander's 89 and he's a legend in musical theatre. Chicago, Cabaret. Tell me about your history with him and getting that phone call. Well, um, Greg Pierce I've known for a very long time. One of the first musicals I ever did in New York was at the Fringe Festival. It was called Two Girls from Vermont and it was about the riff on Two Gentlemen of Verona, the Shakespeare play. And it was a completely crazy, typical fringe show with the drag queen and pop songs and, you know, just out completely out there. Um, and Greg um, had a small role in it. And, um, you know, we, we bonded in working on that show and then we basically never spoke to each other again for 10 years. <laughs> and then um, I got this phone call from my agent saying that Greg Pierce and John Kander wanted to meet with me to talk about a project. And, um, you know, it was completely brain-breaking because I hadn't spoken to Greg in a long time. And John Kander um, is probably one of the most influential artists in my life. So, you know, when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, I saw Cabaret, the film, for the first time. And it showed me a side of musicals that I didn't know existed, which is that um, politics and entertainment can coexist in a musical. 
Um, it, I, I watched that thing so many times on, on video growing up um, that I almost said no because I was too scared to meet him or think about working with him. I didn't know how that could possibly work. Um, but I took myself off to a meeting at his, his brownstone with Greg and I'd read the script, the book, hadn't heard any music and we just had an incredibly beautiful conversation and he is the essence of grace and humility. Um, and we got to the point where, I, mean, we were, I was speaking very frankly about dramaturgy and about the questions I had about the script. I, I just told myself before I walked in there that I have to treat him like any other writer of a new play or musical that I would encounter. And we had a really great, very vigorous, rigorous conversation. And then there was a point where I had to, I said, can I listen to some music? I haven't heard any music. And he got really shy. And he said, oh, the music's all the way upstairs. I don't know. And <laughs> Greg said, why don't I go upstairs and get the music and then you can play it. And he just kind of shuffled around and then Greg went upstairs and he looked at me and he said, you know, Bob, as in Bob Fosse, who's one of my heroes, the director that he worked with a lot in his early career. He said, you know, Bob always said that there's just some people who are gonna be shy their whole lives, and John Kander, you're one of those people. And, um, you know, and he said that he's completely em always embarrassed and afraid to share new material because he thinks it's gonna be terrible. Um, which made me, you know, I could cry just remembering that moment because this is a man who has achieved so much, who's pushed barriers, who's changed the game in terms of musicals. And to have that kind of humility and insecurity still at this point was profound. And then he played the final song of the show, which is probably one of the most devastating pieces of music. So inspiring and beautiful and sad and hopeful. And I just kind of cried in his, his living room. And then um, after he played it, he looked over at me and he said, what do you think? And, um, you know, it was beautiful. And then at the end of the meeting, he said to me, so what do you think? Would you like to work with us on this? Um, and we all kind of did a weird group hug and then <laughs> I left and I walked to the subway and I remember thinking, this is one of those things when you move to New York and you have nothing but hopes and dreams that you can't ever imagine really could happen to you. And it did. Wow. Let's talk a bit about the music in the show because for, for big Kanda fans out there, they, they won't be disappointed. And at the same time, there's a lot of freshness and there's also contemporary, it's like a fusion of both. Can we talk about that a little sure. bit? Sure. Um, you know, this is one of the things about Kander and his collaboration with Greg Pierce that is so incredible, because Greg is in his 30s and Kander is almost 90. Um, and the way that they push each other, the way that they collaborate, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of music that is, it, the, you know, the essence of why Kander is so great. Um, it's vibrant, it's dangerous, it's dirty, it's exciting. Um, and at the same time, there are a number of songs that feel like a, a young, new composer. Um, he's really pushed himself in his relationship with Greg. They found you know, a lot of new ideas for musicals. There's a, there's a lot in this that does not feel like a musical you've ever seen before. Um, and that's partially why I got on board, I'm always looking for material that feels like it's pushing the boundaries of what we understand theater to be, and I feel this musical does that. And, you know, it's just watching someone like John Kander tra challenge himself, um, and watching, you know, a young, exciting playwright like Greg Pierce, um, you know, be in that, in that world together is, it just shows you that you can just never, ever stop growing um, or, or going to dark places as an artist, there's a big payoff on the other side. What about, what does push you as an artist? Because I see your body of work and I saw your production of Eclipsed on Broadway, Party People at the Public, both very political pieces. Now Kid Victory, I know you're doing Macbeth. It seems like you have such an eclectic um, body of work. What, what drives you as a director? Um. I think for me, it's always about the story. Um, I was an actor for many years, and there was a point where I realized that as an actor, you are, um, you are controlled by what's offered to you, and I, I'm very interested in 
things that have um, something to do with the world that we're living in today that's challenging it or it, that's changing it. And as an actor, I didn't have that control over content. And that's why I decided I was gonna become a director, was because that way I felt like, like every single thing I was doing, every single moment of my artistic life um, could be devoted to having a conversation with an audience that was vigorous, that was about something relevant, um, that was engaged in what it, the lives we were all living together. Um, and that's really, when I am interested in a script, it's about that. It, is it 21st century art? Does it feel contemporary? Um, and does it feel necessary? I definitely see that in your work. I also feel like your work is, um, and this makes sense when you and I spoke previously, you said that you push people very hard, you push the whole production team to really um, get the best out of every show. What, what's your motivation behind that? How do you keep that level constantly when you're working on a production? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, I wish I did. Um, I know every single production, there's a moment when I look in a designer's eyes or I look in the actor's eyes and they're pleading with me to stop. <laughs> or they think, I think I've, or, you know, I've done, I can see that they think that they've done every single thing that they can and that they've used, used every iota of creativity that they have. But it's my job as a director to know when there's more to give. And I feel like I just keep pushing my collaborators, and that's the writers, the actors, the designers, the stage management team, and myself. Um, every day I go, have we told the story with every fiber of our being? Are we holding anything back? Did we create a safe space inside of ourselves for ourselves? Um, and if so, how do I get in there? Because the audience is the, are the people who have to get everything. Um, and so it's just, it's just a, it comes with a certain kind of analysis. Um, you know, when I just look at a, a scene, um, I look at a moment and I think, have we given everything? Is it, can it be more dangerous? Can it be more funny? Can it be more poignant? Um, it's my job as a director to mine the human existence on stage um, and not make it safe. Mm -hmm. What do you hope the audience comes away from Kid Victory? I know that's a very broad question, but what is one thing that you hope audiences, mem members will come away with? Um, you know, the thing, uh, the question of our time, and people talk about this all the time, but the question I think this moment that we all are struggling with is the question of compassion. What is enough compassion? Is there such a thing as enough compassion? Um, what do we understand about ourselves and compassion? And I feel like one of the things this, this play um, is advocating is accepting everybody's humanity in whatever form it, com it comes and just being really rigorous with ourselves um, about acceptance of other people and their journeys. And um, that's what I think the show, why, where, why people are so moved by the show, why there's so many you know, tears and sniffles at the end um, and smiles. It's because I think they realize watching it how much more we all have to give. It's, it's definitely a show that makes you think about being more open-minded um, and more compassionate, for sure. I want to open it up to some audience questions. Did anybody want to ask a question? Hi, Lisa. I was wondering, what advice would you give to someone who's hesitant to share their art like John is? Um, well, I think whatever you're doing in, in life as an artist, the first thing you have to feel is that your story is worth telling. Um, and if you don't believe that your story is worth telling, then you, you should be an accountant. Um, <laughs> because it takes so much bravery, it takes so much guts to put yourself out there. Um, you know, when I talk about that little safe space that I feel like the designers or the writers or the actors are saving, that's usually where the real gold is, that's usually where the real transcendent 
emotional mining is. Um, and you really have to believe that what you, what, what you want to share with the world is worth it. Um, how you get self-confidence, I don't know. It's, everybody has a different journey. Um, but you just have to trust that, that it's worth telling and that people will care if you tell it with rigorous truth. Hey, how are you? Um, I'm just wondering when you knew you wanted to be a director, like if there was a show you saw that just made you fall in love with theater? Well, I, I fell in love with theater when I was quite young and I, I was a very focused person. I studied you know, acting and theater for, as a teenager and I, I never wanted to do anything else. Um, and I also directed a lot um, when I couldn't, when I wasn't working uh, as an actor, I would figure out ways to just be working. And so, so I put things together. I didn't think of myself as a director per se. I just thought my, of myself as a person who put things together. Um, and then when it, when it came time, you know, after grad school, moving to New York, um, to kind of really take a pragmatic assessment of what was gonna move me forward in the most satisfying way and what would allow me to work all the time, not some of the time. It seemed like an easy decision. And I also had these incredible teachers in grad school who said to me in the first year, we're gonna let you direct something once a year because we think that this is worth nurturing, even though I was there as an actor. Um, and I, to this day, um, Stephen Berenson and Brian McElhaney at Trinity Rep Conservatory, um, they, they saved my, you know, my life because they gave me the tools when I was ready to make that move. They knew before I did. I was wondering what was the most difficult part directing this musical for you? Um, I would say the most difficult part was the research because it's quite a, it, there are parts of it that's quite dark um, and just immersing yourself in that research and then inflicting that research upon the cast and then talking about it and also pushing um, the incredible lead actor Brandon Flynn you know, into those dark places based on those research, that was, that was the hardest, but that's, you know, that's your job. Hey, Liesl. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, so I read that you're the uh, uh, first woman of color to be nominated, uh, director to be nominated for a Tony. Uh, do you feel like you're a role model now for other women who want to be directors, or uh, did you have any role models yourself growing up? Um, it's crazy to think of yourself as a role model, um, but I am aware from the letters that I receive, emails, social media messages that I get, that I'm definitely a person who's doing something like I'm doing for the first time, um, which is crazy to me that in 20, now 17, um, as a woman of color, I'm, I'm, I'm doing things that other people haven't done. Um, and that's, that's a very serious conversation about access that we all have to continually have and demand. Um, so I'm, I am aware that um, people look to me as a, as a person who's um, trailblazing, who's knocking down walls and doors. Um, and that, you know, that's, that is a scary feeling because <laughs> I'm just trying to live my life. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, I grew up in South Africa during during apartheid, during the struggle, and I come from a political world, and the only thing I know how to do is fight for space and fight for my voice and others' voices who are not um, allowed time in, in the mainstream. Um, so, you know, that's just, I don't think I'll ever stop doing that. I don't think I'll ever stop caring about that. Um, and in terms of who my role models were growing up, um, it was, it's really about political voices more than, you know, theater directors or actors per se. It was people who were con trying to build a civil society and who were trying to make space for people um, to be free. That I think is always the thing that's attracted to me to writers, artists, is who is out there every day showing each other how to be free in this world. And I know that for you, you work to give a lot of young people of colour access. That's a big thing for you at the associates on your shows and stuff. Yes, women and people of colour, because one of the things I know from, from you know, my struggle getting a, a foot in the door is, um, you know, if I'm not thinking about it, who else is? 
right? So if I'm not fighting for designers who are people of color, who are women, if I'm not fighting for stage managers, if I'm not, if I'm not the one saying, please don't tell me everybody around me is going to be a white man, um, then I will be surrounded by white men. That is how it goes. Um, so that's just, you know, I, I just, that was an early a thing that I did early on. And fortunately, I don't get the blindsided look anymore from the people in, in positions of power when I ask these questions. Um, people are starting to understand that we ju it has to be a given. Um, though, you know, I still see, I still see announcements for, for shows and every single creative person, um, you know, is white or is a man and you know, our work isn't done, but they're just, you, somebody just has to take the reins and say, I'm gonna be the one who's gonna, you know, ask the questions and make people uncomfortable, and that is okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show today. So, for anyone who wants to know how to go to Kid Victory, tell us how. You go to the Vineyard Theatre's website um, and buy tickets because we're selling very quickly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.